Welcome to the Rational Egoist. I'm your host, Michael Leibowitz. Today with us, our guest is a psychologist, author, and a retired professor of justice, law, and society at American University. He can be described as a Sazian psychologist. Jeffrey Shaler, thank you for being here. Thanks so much for inviting me, Michael. I'm I should have said Dr. Jeffrey Shaler. I apologize. Matter. No, that's fine. I'm not attached to it. Go ahead. <laughs> Thank you. So the, the, the label Sazian psychologist comes from the late psychiatrist Thomas Saz. So right. to get started, who was Thomas Saz? Thomas Saz was a professor of psychiatry. He was born in Hungary and uh, came to this country during... Uh, during the end of the 1940s. And he um, was trained in psychoanalysis at the Chicago Institute of Psychoanalysis, which was the leading place in the world for psych psychoanalysts. And psychoanalysis is different from just psychiatry. Um, but I remember he was picked, he told me, as the crown prince to inherit the mantle of psychoanalysis um, from F.M. Alexander, and he said, no, thanks. I said, well, what did you learn there? He said, well, I learned about what not to do as a psychiatrist. <laughs> and uh, since then, about the 1960s, he uh, began to criticize what was being done to people in the name of psychiatry. And uh, uh, also, he wrote a lot about the relationship between the individual and the state. And he coined the term the therapeutic state, which... A lot of people don't understand this. This was way back in the early 1960s. It was in his book, Law, Liberty, and Psychiatry. And he asserted, which I believe is absolutely true, that, the, that medicine and state are now united in the way that church and state once were. And uh, that the high priests of, of medicine are doing what the priests of various religions did for the last couple hundred years. And that is basically imprison people, deprive them of liberty and responsibility. And uh, while he never taught, and some people, myself included, asserted that one of his greatest successes was to not create a new school of quote, psychoanalysis, he um, influenced the practice a great deal. And uh, I guess if I could sum up the focus of his work, it's on the relationship between liberty and responsibility. And uh, everything comes back to that, whether it's drug policy, working with people through some kind of analysis, which he was not opposed to at all. He was opposed to involuntary commitment. Sure. And that, that he coined as institutional psychiatry. And uh, I, I tracked him down in the 1980s I had been teaching some of his work and um, we hit it off right off, uh, became best friends. And he invited me to join him on various debates around the country and uh, the rest is history. So his most famous book and probably the idea he's most famous for, the book was The Myth of, Myth of Mental Illness. He argued that if I'm correct, and I think I am, not only that mental health illness doesn't exist, but that mental illness is an impossibility. So what exactly did he mean by it? mental health is a myth? I mean, most people just accept that. I mean, mental illness is a myth. Most people just accept that there's mental illnesses. It's a part of our vernacular. Right. So what did he mean? And and I, I assume you share his view. So explain exactly. it. Well, how is mental illness a myth? It's a myth in the sense that it's a metaphor. It's not a literal illness. And in some ways, he contributed to our increased understanding of what really constitutes a disease, an illness. A disease, strictly speaking, refers to some kind of cellular abnormality. Illness refers to basically a subjective experience. But and some people said he should have called the book the myth of mental disease, but it didn't it didn't matter because so much was being done in the name of mental illness that um, that was the primary focus. He said mental illness, first of all, 
we don't know what the mind is. So how could we treat the mind? And the mind, since we since it really doesn't exist, except in a metaphorical sense, it can't be sick, or it can be sick only in a metaphorical sense. For example, we use terms like spring fever, or you may have an alcoholic drink called a screwdriver. We know what we mean, but you don't drink an actual screw, screwdriver. Sure. And spring fever refers to some other experience, but a not, not an actual experience or of illness. And so he differentiated between a metaphorical illness and a literal illness. And uh, many people seem to get very upset because basically he pulled the rug out from under institutional psychiatry and the whole profession of mental health practitioners. Um, he said, basically, if you want to see somebody and talk about yourself and, and get whatever help you think could be useful, by all means, you should be free to do it. But no one should be forced. That was his main point. No one should be forced into some kind of uh, treatment. And now, for example, we hear when people break the law or all of these, this spate of recent murders, people are, are calling for more mental health investigation and treatment. But that really means more uh, involuntary commitment, involuntary treatment, and um, he would just be aghast at what's what's going on in the name of mental health today. So what about, I, growing up, I, I had a lot of behavioral problems. So I had to go to, I don't know, the schools for troubled kids, I, I guess we'll call them. And there were a lot of mental people that would be termed mentally ill. I, I mean, I've seen kids that were hearing voices or at least claiming to hear voices. I, I've seen people who have violent mood swings. Right. I myself am on Zoloft because I have anxiety and a slight case of a obsessive compulsive. I guess you wouldn't call, call it a disease, but I, I certainly know that if I don't take the medication, because I've gotten off it a few times, and every time I do, I end up spiraling in my head. I mean, I'm not imagining that. I know it happens. So sure. in cases like these, what? How would you label it? If it's not mental illness, it's clearly something that's disturbing to the person that's experiencing these symptoms right. for lack of a better word. Right. He would say, and I agree with him, that that represents a problem in living or an existential problem in living. When you talk about your mind spinning out of control or your thoughts, people claiming that they hear voices, strictly speaking, that's that's called thinking. You know, whenever we think, we have conversations in our head. And they're not literal conversations the way we have with other people. They may be good conversations or troubling conversations, but they're not actual voices. The, the voices that we claim to hear are our thoughts. That's the way we think. So in some ways, when psychiatrists and people who support them, claim that mental illness means that people are hearing voices, I've always responded by saying, well, what would you call it if they don't hear any voices? But I isn't said, there a difference, uh, uh, Dr. Ahead. Shaler? Isn't there a difference? I can differentiate, for instance, between the thoughts I'm thinking in regard to the conversation that we're having right. Right. and your voice coming over my headphones. There's right. clearly a difference there. They're not the same thing. So if somebody with out and outside stimulus is getting the sensation that they're hearing a voice like I'm hearing yours. That's different in kind from thoughts. A absolutely. Now, how would you differentiate? I'll, I'll speak the way Tom would speak. How would you differentiate between someone who is lying about hearing voices? And well, that I couldn't do. That's right. As an outside observer, I could not do that. That's, that's right. accurate. Right. Um, like say a person who claims that he shot someone because a cat told him to do that. Well, one thing Tom would say is, well, why do you have to do what this alleged cat tells you to do? You have control. You can exercise behavioral control. You may believe the cat is telling you this, but that doesn't mean you have to act on it. The second thing is, how do you know that that person is not lying? 
Many people will lie in order to get out of responsibility or to boost their ego in some way. But um, he would say that uh, voices are part of thinking. They're troublesome, of course, at me for many people. But they're also, um, you know, when we praise ourselves, we hear a voice that says, good job, Michael. Um, and we say things to ourselves uh, that encourage us to keep doing what we want to do or discourage us. Um, but we should not use those voices as an excuse for harming other people. And that's where much of his writings come back, comes back to libertarian philosophy. He sure. was a hardcore libertarian in the way of F.A. Hayek in uh, his book, The Road to Serfdom, and so am I. Uh, classical liberalism is what Hayek taught originally. And of course, I think you're a libertarian yourself. Yes. Uh, he was not a member of the Libertarian Party, neither am I, but he was very much a libertarian in life and deed. So to say that me mental illness is a myth, that's not to deny that there can be a biological or a neurological basis for the troubles in with living that people are experiencing, right? So if somebody is, say, hearing voices, I, I know we, we can't know as an outside observer, but supposing they do, or right. they're experiencing rapid mood swings or you know, obsessions, right. whatever, to say that that's not a mental illness is not to say that something might not be going wrong in that person's brain or with their hormones or neurotransmitters, right? That's absolutely right, Michael. And he would never deny that. The the, I mean, because the Diagnostic Statistical Manual for Mental Disorders originally differentiated between what mental health professionals called organic um, mental disorders and the non-organic ones. In other words, if you had a tumor in your brain or a stroke or any number of physiological diseases, you might present with anxiety, paranoia, uh, hearing voices, any number of things. And those are clearly related to some biological uh, disorder. But what time, and then there are the ones that have no dis dis physiological disorder that has been identified. What Tom would say is whether we identify some physiological component or not, that should never be used as an excuse for avoiding responsibility. And that's where so much of his work comes back to the criminal justice system and the rule of law, because psychiatrists today have basically become an extension of law. Uh, that was not the way psychoanalysis was originally set up. That's not the way psychologists were taught to practice, uh, but uh, that's what's happened. For example, I've debated many psychiatrists and they have said to me that they can tell who is going to harm self or others. And I tell them, you know for a fact that we cannot determine who is going to harm self or others with, and this is the language of statistics, with a certainty beyond that expected by chance. That means beyond the accuracy of guessing. We can't do it. And they, when pressed, will say, you're right. And then I say, but then why do you assert that you can do it? They assert for legal reasons, Michael, they assert in order to commit somebody to a mental institution, which is basically the deprivation of liberty. And the flip side of that is to remove responsibility, which is the basis of the insanity defense. And that's where Tom's work focused primarily on involuntary commitment and the insanity defense. And I'm one of the only colleagues of his that keeps focusing on those two issues. Other people like to debate uh, whether the mind is the expression of brain, whatever. Tom would say, if we know for a fact that it is, then that's a neurological issue. It's not a psychological issue. So as people keep saying, uh, we're getting closer to seeing that the brain produces all of these experiences, he wouldn't object to that at all, although he would be very skeptical, as I am. But uh, he would say, then that's a new that's a new aspect of neurology. Um, that still doesn't justify removing responsibility 
or putting people into a mental hospital. And that's the bottom line that we always have to come back to as Zossian psychologists. And that's what bugs psychiatrists so much. Now, just to, to be clear, there's no, as far as I know, objective test for any claimed mental disorder, right? There's not a blood test or a, an MRI or a PET scan or an autopsy, anything that can tell that a person either is or was ex mentally ill, right? That, that's absolutely uh, correct, Michael, because remember, whenever somebody claims to diagnose a mental illness, they're making a value judgment about their behavior. How can you find a physiological basis for a value judgment? It's impossible. And another way to look at this, Michael, is all real diseases are identifiable in the body at autopsy. You cannot identify schizophrenia, depression, attention deficit, hyperactive disorder, anxiety. This is not to claim that people are having troublesome experiences. They just don't qualify as diseases. That's the point. Right. It, it's interesting because for me in high school, I was diagnosed with a couple different maladies. And one of them that they told me that I had was post-traumatic stress disorder. And right. I, I ended up in prison. And when I was talking to the prison psychologist, he told me, no, no, you don't have post-traumatic stress disorder, which is kind of illustrative because it's happened to many people I know that upon seeing different psychiatrists, they receive different diagnoses. Right. Later on in prison, I started experiencing very bad panic attacks and I didn't know what they were. And if right. anyone that's ever had a panic attack, when you don't know what it is, it's scary as hell. Exactly. So I was also, you know, as a result, experiencing tension in my neck and I was getting headaches. So I went to medical. Medical referred me to the psychology department. When I went to the psychology department, they told me, no, 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 these are physical symptoms. You've got to go to medical. Back oh, to medical. Right. They So right. I went back and forth a few times. Finally, uh, psychology, the psychiatrist put me on, you know, psychotropic medications. Right. The headaches, though, did not go away. So I went back to medical. I said, well, I've gotten the treatment you told me about. Now I'm still having the headaches. And now the doctor told me, well, the headaches you're getting are being caused by the medication. And I'm just thinking, so you told me because of the headaches, I needed to go see a psychiatrist. The psychiatrist put me on medication. And now you're telling me the medication's causing the headaches. Right. And it just, I mean, it really uh, maybe debilitated. I don't know if that's the right word, but it, it certainly lessened my trust in the medical profession, at least in prison and certainly in the, the psychiatric profession. I, I absolutely agree. And I think that's what I consider evidence that people that make diagnoses like this are quacks and charlatans. <laughs> uh, psychiatry should go the way of... Um, Phrenology, which was an ancient system of diagnosing people's uh, behaviors and uh, attitudes based on the lumps and valleys in their head. Um, and how, how would you diagnose me? You can see maybe some of the lumps on my head. Do, do I, I look I like a nut? That, <laughs> no, I think you're a very courageous guy. And I would praise you for your independence and work in the area of prison reform. <laughs> Thank Clearly, you. Clearly, I can tell by the shape of your head that that's your kind of <laughs> that kind of person. No, the bottom line is, is that we've got to approach any of these psychiatric diagnoses with a healthy dose of skepticism, and must always look at the relationship between those diagnoses and freedom and responsibility. That's what it always will come back to. I mean, a lot of times I'll have these discussions with people. I've been having them ever since I read um, the book. Actually, when I first read The Myth of Mental Illness, I wasn't convinced. Then when I read the book that you edited, Saz Under Fire, and I actually saw the objections to Saz, right. I went far more in the direction of, of Saz's viewpoint because he handled himself so well in the, the debates. Right. But whenever the way that I explain it to people when I have this discussion is, look, disease applies to physical organisms. The mind is not a physical organism. Therefore, it cannot be diseased. It's like right. saying that a color can be heavy. The, the right. category error, as Saz said. But right. then people will say, so you don't deny that people experience these problems. And I say, no. And they say, well, then it's just a semantic issue. What's the difference? 
to me, what the difference is, and I think to Saz, what the difference is, when you call it a, a disease, you then have experts who are assumed to be qualified to diagnose right. such a disease. And right. in the case of mental diseases, these experts then get to judge whether someone's dangerous and deprive them of their liberty. That's the the Absolutely. real issue at hand, right? Exactly. And uh, never forget their relationship with the state. They have the power then by the state to do certain things to people. And that's where Tom and I object most strenuously. If you want to go to see a psychiatrist who claims you're schizophrenic or manic depressive or any of these things, you're free to do it. Just like with this whole thing about transgender. I was uh, going to bring it up. I'm oh, glad good. you did. Well, it's been a great concern to me because, and Tom would agree with me. He and I agreed on just about everything. There's some things we did not agree on, but with the transgender issue and newspapers absolutely will not touch my point of view on this. I believe that people have the right to call themselves whatever they want, but let's be clear, gender and sex are completely different. And if you put in those, if any of your listening audience put in the words gender and sex on Google, You'll, it's, it will say gender refers to a subjective experience of being male or female. Sex refers to the biological difference. So what Tom and I have been, would say, and he wrote about this years ago, is if, you want, if you're a biological male and you say that you feel like a woman, by all means, you have the freedom to call yourself whatever you want or dress appropriately. I remember when I was in high school, there was a fellow, a male who was dressed in a, well, he, he wore a dress. I was, I mean, I was puzzled as most people were, but did he have the right to do that? Of course he did. But did that make him a woman? No. And what happens with, unfortunately, a lot of people in this transgender movement, uh, what they say is that they are the sex that they want to be. And there are consequences to that for both science and demographic informations, et cetera. I, in, in Europe, when I was speaking there one time, I brought this up and they said, in England, they said, we are puzzled by you Yanks who keep putting on surveys a question regarding um, gender when you mean sex. And I said, absolutely. So what happens if you fill out a survey and it says, what is your gender? Well, if you are biologically a male and you say that you feel like a female, so you put female down, you're getting inaccurate information, yes. right? I mean, it's, and that can make a big difference. So um, he would say, and I've, I've said this repeatedly, of course, this is part of freedom of speech. You can call yourself whatever you want. You could say you're an alien from Jupiter. It doesn't make any difference, but that doesn't make you an alien from Jupiter or make you the opposite sex from what you are. Sure. I remember reading in, in his book, Faith and Freedom, when he wrote about the trials and travails of Deidre McCloskey, right. who used to be Donald McCloskey. Right. And Saz made the point that, look, it's still, there's nothing that's going to change biology. The right. person is still a, a male, but he also made the point, And I think this is very important because you have people now that are saying, this is a mental illness. It's a mental disorder. Yeah. And that to me is just as dangerous, if not more so than somebody calling themselves the wrong sex, because as what happened with the Deidre McCloskey is her family ultimately had either tried, I can't remember, or had her committed had her committed. Yes. Yeah. And if P and if that's the problem, if people start accepting that this is a mental disorder, then you, you might have psychiatrists doing just that, having them committed. Right. And that's horrible to deprive somebody of their liberty because they right. haven't committed a crime. Our whole society is based on the idea or one of the ideas is that you can't be deprived of your liberty unless it's proven that you've committed a crime. Right. But with so the, the, the therapeutic state, that is circumvented by so-called experts who say, no, this person's ill and needs to be hospitalized. Right. It, no, you're it, absolutely right, Michael. I completely agree. And Tom would say right on. Absolutely. So with this, where I'm glad you brought it up. because I just want to ask you, so how do you, where do you see this transgender issue going? Because you have, in, in my view anyways, two sides that are so far apart and so right. very wrong. 
Because for me, I don't care if somebody wants to wear a dress. I don't know what it's like. I don't know if there's a biological reason for it or not. I know that they, they claim that they feel like women or feel like men. It doesn't much affect me. I really don't right. care. Of course. But when they, you know, when there's demands about public institutions and bathroom sharing, see, the problem for me is, is a lot of that would go away if we would get rid of so many public institutions. If we were a more private society, then the private business or the private school could decide their bathroom policy for themselves. But when you have such a Leviathan state, then everybody wants the privileges and the rights that the state is providing. Right. But, but on the flip side is there's people who say this is a mental illness and they're very bigoted and prejudiced. And I'm not saying there's no in between. I'm just trying to state the two polar opposites. So how is that going to get resolved or, or and more to the point, how can the theories of size help to resolve it? Well, through education and uh, through people like yourself who, who put on um, podcasts um, through professors um I taught for many years at quite a few different institutions, uh, academic institutions. Unfortunately, I was persecuted uh, for my ideas. I was probably, I was told that I was the most popular uh, professor at American University and students flocked to me because they wanted to hear the ideas of Thomas Zoss. And um, basically the administration and well, it was mainly the psychology department. They just flipped out that I was doing this. And uh, not only that I was doing it, but that I was right. I mean, some of them came to my classes and tried to shout me down. And they said, you know, there is there is clearly a gene or a mutation for a gene that makes a person schizophrenic or depressed. And I said, well, would you tell us what that is? And they they couldn't do it. Of course not. They couldn't do it because it doesn't exist, Michael. That's the whole thing. So we have to take these people to task. The more we can write, the more we can speak out, uh, write letters, write opinion pieces in the newspapers. That's what I'm spending a lot of time doing in my retirement. Um, the more we can educate people about what actually exists, we should be able to debate these issues over and over again. Unfortunately, many academic institutions will close the door on that. So we have to keep pounding to give people the right to listen to different points of view. And uh, I think even though I'm an independent and I was a liberal for many, many years, some of the worst are the liberal presses. I mean, they tried to uh, squash any of Zoss's ideas. They often begin by saying the conservative Thomas Zoss. <laughs> well, why the, what the hell does that have to do with anything? You know, they always want to put him down and they say the same thing about me. And my colleagues, they always want to try to put you down for your political orientation uh, before they deal with the ideas. And I think that's because they're scared of the ideas. They don't want to deal with them. And I consider the New York Times and the Washington Post to be among the worst offenders. Um, and I would welcome the opportunity to debate any of them on these issues, but they won't do it. They won't do it. So I think that's where we need to go, Michael. All right. Now, your own work in a book that was very near and dear to my heart, your book, Addiction is a Choice. Right. I read it about the same time I read a book by Stanton Peel called The Truth About Addiction and Recovery. Right. And the reason that I like them so much, is because even prior to reading them, and I'm sure maybe someone will say, well, it was just confirmation bias. Both my parents were heroin addicts. I had an alcohol and a drug problem myself. But I never bought the idea that addiction was a disease. And the practical effects of it were that Addicts would absolve their own behaviors right. based on the idea that they had a disease. And around the time I read your book, I was participating in uh, something that was called Tier 3. It was a drug and alcohol treatment program I did, took in prison, and it was based on the NAAA model. When I told them I didn't think addiction was a disease, they told me I was in denial. That's right. why I didn't think it was a disease. Then I read Stanton Peel's book, and, and I said, well, hold on a second. Here's a mental health expert that agrees with me. Right. You may think he's wrong, but you certainly can't say that he's in denial Right, is the reason for it. But they just dismissed me. They would say, well, addiction is an allergy. It's an allergy to the drug. Uh -huh. And I responded, well, hold on. What allergy in the world do you, exactly. does a person become exposed to that makes them want more of the thing they're allergic to? That's a very good point, Michael. Very good point. Good. 
Go ahead. Yeah. And, and then I, I found out that the way you test for a normal allergy is to inject it into the skin and you'll have a skin, your, your skin reaction. And right. that's how you'll know. But clearly you can't inject alcohol into your skin and have that problem. And certainly heroin addicts inject all the time and don't have that problem. Right. And then they responded with, well, it's really a metaphor. So the, the sands were constantly shifting in, in the debate. Right. And I was constantly, well, I didn't really feel it, but I was made to, they wanted to make me feel as if I was just in denial and I needed to accept their religion because right. that's really what it was. Exactly. So what is your... How do I put this? What is your position? One on addiction being a disease, two on NA and AA. And how is NA and AA, how are they harmful, do you think? I know well, it's a lot, but I I, I can well, hear with no, it's what I deal with all the time, Michael. Don't worry about it. Um, what we what people mean when they say that addiction is a disease is that people cannot control their behavior. That's called the loss of control theory of addiction. And it was established during prohibition, during the temperance era, throughout the 1940s. Actually, it was very prominent through repeal of prohibition. But today, people in the disease model camp claim that some people who have this alleged disease cannot control their behavior. But we know through scientific research and uh, studies that people can control their behavior even when they're tricked into believing they're not drinking alcohol, but they are. And Stanton Peel was one of the first persons to report this. I was strongly influenced by Stanton. He's a friend of mine, a colleague. Um, he claimed that I went too far <laughs> because, uh, which I considered a great compliment um, because he claimed that some behaviors were not controllable by the individual. And I, and my position is, is that behavior is always volitional. If it's not volitional, it's a, it's a seizure or um, like an epileptic convulsion. But people always um, make decisions to do X, Y, and Z when we call it their particular mode of conduct, which is what behavior means. There is no such thing as an involuntary um, behavior. So, um, except for you would exclude reflexes from that, correct? Right. Of course. Okay. You know, you have, you know, when somebody, the doctor hits your knee, that's called a patellar knee reflex. Your, your leg jumps out. You're not willfully doing that. Um, and, uh, a reflex is not a conscious decision, but when it comes to reaching for a drug or a drink, of course, that's a volitional activity. And the other thing is, is that if the claims of the disease model is, are true, then how could anybody ever quit? They want they, people to quit. They couldn't. It's always a decision. So yeah. that's what that was the basis of my book. I mean, I was around during Woodstock and I smoked my share of marijuana and dropped LSD and all that stuff. But I realized that it was not good for me. Not before the show today, right? Not today. No, it's been a long time. But um, I made a decision to stop. And that was the basis of my book. It became so obvious. I was on a, a county drug abuse advisory council, and I stepped into this mess by innocently saying years ago, I said, this isn't the disease. You're only saying that to get insurance reimbursements and to get people put into treatment, but it's not a real disease. And my God, I was just lambasted from the county up to Annapolis and Maryland Shaler is dangerous, blah, 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 blah. Now, to get to the next point, what's dangerous about treatment for any of these disorders? What's dangerous is when the state forces people into Alcoholics Anonymous or Narcotics Anonymous. And what I did was worked on the first big case that was taken on by the American Civil Liberties Union in, in Maryland. And um, a, a plaintiff said, I was arrested for drunk driving. The state wants me to go into AA. I'm an atheist and I would rather watch Jimmy. I mean, that's like watching Jimmy Swagger on television. This is a AA is a religious experience. I don't want to do that. I'd rather go to jail is what he said, but the state would not allow him to do that. The ACLU listened to me. We met with the attorney general of uh, Maryland um, and Basically, we argued that 
forcing people into AA and any form of treatment is a violation of the First Amendment's establishment and free exercise clauses. The state cannot touch religion in any capacity. And we successfully showed that AA and all treatment is a form of religious activity. So that was a big deal. And uh, that's the danger as far as I'm concerned. Now, Tom would say, and I, I agree, go to whatever kind of, quote, treatment that you want. You should be free to do that. And one that I helped start with my friend Joe Gerstein, uh, uh, a physician, is called Smart Recovery. And that's been actually prevalent in prisons now, uh, at least on the East Coast. He's having a big impact. He and I and a couple of other psychologists helped to get that started. It's a secular form of help for people that want help. There's no higher power. There's no idea that you have to agree that you can't control your behavior, none of that stuff. It's all very practical common sense. Uh, which I support and Tom would support him. But it's when, again, Michael, it's when the state gets involved in this, that's the problem right there. When I was taking the tier three program, I think you're going to appreciate this because before I read addiction is a choice, I was told about this woman who, because I had argued, well, they said AA is the only viable treatment. And I said, well, what about rational recovery? Right. That's the only other one I'd heard at the time. And they told me, well, there's this woman and she left AA and she joined rational recovery and she ended up dr driving drunk and killing somebody. Right. And I'm first of all, one person doesn't prove anything. Of course. But secondly, they were so wrong on the facts. I didn't know it until I read your book because you included the story of the woman, Audrey Kishline, who right. had gone from AA. I think she went to rational recovery. Then she tried right. moderation management. And as it turned out, by the time she actually had that accident, she was back in AA. Right. Of course, That's when I brought that up to the guy, all of a sudden, the single instance didn't prove anything. Right. Because now it went against his view, which is more to your point that it's a religious activity. Right. Whenever somebody will not allow themselves to be falsified, no matter what evidence is presented, you have a, a, a religious mentality, if not an right. actual religion. Well, we can thank the philosopher Sir Karl Popper for that. Any kind of theory has to be falsifiable. And the disease model of mental illness and uh, addiction, they're, they're not falsifiable. You can't disprove any of that because whenever you disprove them, then people say, well, that person wasn't really mentally ill or really addicted, et cetera. Uh, it's all nonsense. Um, Have you done any work in the prisons at all? I taught a course in psychology for the um, Montgomery County Seven Locks Detention Center, and uh, I enjoyed it immensely. Um, and they just loved everything I was talking about in terms of Thomas Zoss. So it was very, um, very successful. When I was on this advisory council pro bono years ago, I took uh, state legislators through a tour of the state prisons in Maryland that was a very enlightening uh, experience, I must say, because we were trying to do reform back then. Uh, so that's the extent of my work uh, in that area. But um, I try to cover a lot of different bases, uh, Michael. For example, Tom's work has applications in the area of drug prohibition. One of his most important ones is suicide. And um, he, uh, he did, unfortunately, commit suicide. I don't know why. I shouldn't say unfortunately, because... I think he made the right decision when he did that. I wrote about that on the website that I made um, in his honor, zoss.com. And uh, he had broken his spine at home and uh, was in terrible agony. I guess he was in his early 90s. And uh, he didn't want to spend the rest of his life um, dependent on doctors and in a assisted living place. Um, and um, so he ended his life, which I think, and he had argued everyone has the right to, to do. So uh, one, one thing when I've talked about that is if people have the right to self-destruct, for example, through smoking, drug use, whatever, then let's look at the absolute worst case scenario. And that would be the right to commit suicide. Do people have the right to commit suicide? And I believe absolutely they do. Now I've debated 
Oregon's death with dignity people. And we got into it in a very heated way here in Washington years ago. And finally, I said to them, do you believe that uh, people have the right to commit suicide? And they said, no. Only a physician can make that decision. <laughs> and I said, well, that's the difference between you and me right there. And that's exactly what I mean and Tom meant by the therapeutic state. Only if a doctor who's sanctioned by the state is involved, the individual does not have the right to do that. And, you know, if somebody tells his doctor, I feel like killing myself, you know what can happen then. Sure. You get put into a mental institution. Sure. I mean, it's terrible. So, you know, uh, Dr. Shaler, or Jeff, sorry, my mother committed suicide. And prior to my mother's suicide, I was very pro a person's right to commit suicide. Right. And after she committed suicide, I didn't change my view at all. I mean, I was devastated and I was sad by it, but ultimately sure. it was her life. And I don't think that anybody has the right to make somebody keep living if they don't want to. In my right. mother's case, she had been clean off of drugs for a few years and now she had gotten back on. She was in her fifties now. She wasn't young anymore and she just didn't want to live that life of a drug addict any longer. So she took her own life. And I just don't the idea that there's some outside person that's in a better position to judge whether someone should stay alive to me is the height of arrogance and stupidity. It's just, it's absolutely absurd. I completely agree with you. And Tom would say right on. Absolutely. Uh, I, I wish I could have met him so I could hear him say right on. Oh <laughs> yeah. Great. Well, you can hear him through me. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes, I can. Uh, actually, at least two of my most important mentors committed suicide. The other person was Morris Chaffetz, who was the founding director of the National Institute on Alcohol Abuse and Alcoholism. And he was revolutionary when he established that branch of NIH because he argued that addicts and alcoholics could control their drinking. And that's anathema to the disease modelists. They just flipped out because if it's a disease, you can't just take the substance sometime and stop and control your consumption. And he said, absolutely, you can. Um, unfortunately, well, his wife died. He was very close to his wife and uh, he felt like there was no point in living after his wife died. But both he and Tom were at my daughter's wedding. And so I was very close to them. And it was like you say with your mother, it was upsetting. But of course, they have the right to do that. Before I let you go, do you yeah. have anything? Did I forget anything? Did we leave anything out? I want to make sure that we get everything that you need to say because it's important. Oh. Well, I think what's important is for people to trust themselves when it comes to seeing that the emperor called psychiatry has no clothes. Not only that the emperor has no clothes, but there is no emperor. We need to demolish these false icons and false gurus and uh, stand up for ourselves, as long as it's not at the direct expense of other people. And of course, that's the motto of libertarianism, that people should be free to do what they want, as long as they don't harm anybody else in the direct process. And I think that that's where we need to come, come, keep coming back to, Michael. And you're doing a great service by allowing people that platform. Thank you very much. Thank you. Is there anywhere that people can find you if they want to read your writings or just check you out online. Where can they of course, go? You just put my name, Jeffrey Shaler, S-C-H-A-L-E-R on the web, and I'll pop up all over the place. Um, one person was very, very nice and made a Wikipedia page uh, uh, outlining my work. So you, you can contact me on the web, and uh, I encourage you to do that. That's how you found me, and I'm happy yes. that you did. So. As am I. Thank Good. you very much for being with me today. And I, I hope you'll come back on because you, you've right. got, I think, a lot more to say. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Michael. Thank you. For now, this is The Rational Egoist. I'm Michael Leibowitz signing off. Remember, like, share, comment. What's the other one? Like, share, comment, subscribe. Make sure you subscribe. Thanks okay. a lot. Till next time.